What does it mean by that? All right, we'll uh, begin once again. Uh, we were looking at verses uh, 34 to 39 in John chapter 10. And um, I thought it would be good if we can look specifically at verses 34 uh, to 36, just to see what the Lord means in those particular verses. The overall passage, of course, was you know Jesus saying that I am doing the works of the Father, and the works prove that I am from the Father. So based on that, you should be believing in me rather than trying to stone me. So that's the overall context. But then uh, let's also look specifically at these verses 34 to 36, just to have some clarity on what Jesus means when he uses the term gods over there. If someone could read out for us uh, verses 34 to 36. Jesus answered them. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If you call them gods to whom the word of God came from, came, and the scripture cannot be broken, you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God. All right. So uh, here, Jesus just refers back to uh, Psalm 82, uh, where uh, the term I have said you are gods is uh, mentioned. So over there, uh, you know, most of the commentaries, uh, the com I mean, if you were to look up at the, com the commentaries for Psalm 82, all of them very clearly indicate that over there, it's talking about the judges of, um, of Israel. You know, the people who had been placed in positions of power uh, and they would be determining whether a death sentence should be given or a person should be spared, whether someone should be declared innocent or you know uh, uh, condemned as guilty. So these are um, the high authorities who literally have the power of life and death in their hands. Uh, so based on what God says, uh, they are supposed to you know uh, meet out the judgment. So in a sense, uh, they are uh, the spokesman of God. They are the voice of God, and they will be uh, meeting out his justice you know, to the people. So in that sense, uh, they are gods, because they are representing him. Uh, and uh, we see this kind of terminology used even regarding Moses, right? Uh, so that would kind of help us to understand in what sense uh, Psalm 82 is using this term. So if we could just very quickly go to Exodus chapter 4, verse 16, and uh, look at how this uh, whole idea of God is used over there. That would kind of uh, you know help us to understand better. So if we could have one person read out Exodus chapter 4, verse 16. Please, could we have someone read out Exodus 4.16? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. Amen. You shall be to him as God. Now is the Lord saying over here, Moses, from now on you are, you are a God? Most definitely not. All that the Lord is saying that is that, you know, uh, you will be saying what I want you to say. Uh, you will be doing what I want you to do. And uh, Aaron will take these things and he will pass it on to the uh, concerned people. So um, you you will be directly like my representative you know, on this earth. So in that sense, you will be a God literally representing me the one who is you know the one uh, the, the true god so in that sense here as well in psalm 82 the judges are described as gods uh, because they are supposed to be representatives of uh, of the true god yahweh and uh, they are supposed to give judgment according to what yahweh wants so the ones that yahweh condemns uh, they should not spare they should condemn and they should judge on the other hand the ones who are innocent that the ones that Yahweh regards as innocent, 
they do not have the right to exploit them or you know bring false judgment upon them they should not be doing those things but what happens in actually in psalm 82 is that these people they start thinking like as if they are really gods you know and uh, they start exploiting the power which is which has been given to them in their hands and they no longer are representing yahweh correctly they are uh, using um, their position to pervert justice rather than meet out justice the way god wants it uh, want, to be meted out these people are in fact perverting justice and so in psalm 82 it says that you know you may think that you are gods but you're going to die just like everyone else and that will prove that you are no gods at all you know so um, in that sense uh, the term is used in psalm 82 and so here jesus is referring to that and he says you know mere human beings who were uh, authorized by god to carry out justice they were regarded as gods and here i am i have literally come from the father and my works are clearly showing that he is backing me up and uh, i am the one who's going to be you know judging um the everything because the, he says that i think it was in chapter 5 john chapter 5 you know where he talks about yes uh, it was john 5 22 where he says uh, the father uh, you know will will commit all judgment to me i am the one who will be doing all the judging so i am literally from the father and he has appointed me to be judge over all so um me being in that capacity why do you even think it is wrong for me to call myself god when mere human beings human judges were considered as gods you know in that uh, in that sense of small g so uh, so that is the argument which jesus uses over here simply because it would have kind of made them pause and think a little bit i mean these are people who are uh, supposed to be learned in the old testament so uh, they would you know kind of think about this argument this new argument which jesus is presenting and say ha huh, humans when they represented god uh, they were regarded as gods with a small g so here is someone who is claiming to be literally from the father uh, you know um, he, he, because he says right no one has seen him but then i know him so all that he says so they would have to reconsider and think ah okay because of who he is if he is claiming to be God, then maybe we should take him seriously. So this reasoning may not sound very, um, you know, um, it may not really strike us. But to them who are very familiar with the Old Testament scriptures and the and the uh, the thought which was presented in in the scriptures, for them this would have sounded like a valid argument if they were in a position, you know, to open their ears and hear. But if they've already made up their minds and they have closed their ears and they have closed their eyes, then of course the argument would not work. Um, so uh, moving on from there, uh, we would come into John chapter 11, which is the passage where um, you know Jesus raises uh, Lazarus from the dead. And uh, if we could maybe read verses 3, 2, 6, yeah, 3, 4, 5, 6, if one person could read out please. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister loved Anne. Verse 3 onwards, yeah. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Uh, well, actually, I was aiming for, from three, verse 3 itself. Um, you know, verse 3 and then 4, 5, 6. Yeah, if you could, please. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters went to him, saying, Lord, he who loved he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, Uh, maybe we could have another person read because probably her sound is not working very well. You know, maybe at the Bible college, um, the sound is not working very well. If if, an, if another person could read out, please. Uh, chapter 11, verses 3 to 6. 
John chapter 11 verse 3 to 6 Therefore his sisters sent unto him saying Lord behold he whom you love is sick when Jesus heard that he said this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God that the son of God might be glorified thereby Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus and when he had heard therefore that he was sick he stayed two days still in the same place where he was yes, yes. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis in this passage again and again it is repeated that uh, jesus loved these people okay so i think it's like four or five times that this gets mentioned that jesus loved them uh, so here we have in uh, verse 3 where the sisters themselves use this term and they say lord the one you love is sick okay so they they say that and um, uh, then this is the message which jesus sends back to them so the sisters have sent a messenger to jesus saying that the one that you love he is sick so you know please come at the earliest to help uh, you know that kind of a message has been sent now this is jesus reply and this is the reply which he sends back to the sisters when he heard this jesus said the sickness will not end in death no it is for god's glory so that god's son may be glorified through it so jesus has sent a message back to them saying don't worry this sickness is not going to end in death god is going to glorify himself so when the sisters got that message they would have been very you know uh, relieved it would have been such a great relief to receive that message from jesus and then in verse 5 again it is emphasized it is said jesus loved martha and her sister and lazarus and having loved them with this attitude of love it says he chooses to stay there another two days okay so he is staying over there an extra two days not because he does not love them but because you know he wants to glorify god he has been doing everything in line with the father so far according to the father's will and so now he wants to continue glorifying god by uh, you know following the father's timetable and uh, the interesting one thing that we see over here in this uh, verse is how does the how does god glorify himself uh, in, uh, if we look at verse 4 uh, it says uh, no it is for god's glory so that god's son may be glorified through it there are two very interesting ways in which god glorifies himself he glorifies himself not by just lifting himself up he glorifies himself by glorifying the son you know i mean if you look at all uh, the rest of the new testament uh, we see it in so many places where god being who he is takes everything that is his and he places it uh, before the son so that through the son those things will be will be accomplished so the father is always um, engaged in glorifying the son and the son is always engaged in glorifying the father uh, they are never uh, thinking in terms of self but they're always thinking in terms of the other uh, it 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 uh, uh, presents a very beautiful picture of how actual glorification should be done you know um, so uh, we see here that god glorifies himself not by just exalting himself but by glorifying the son and the other lovely thing that we see about how god glorifies himself is that he does it by doing good to people because that's what he says when the, when they you know when they first encounter that blind man uh, the person who had been blind from birth uh, it, it is said over there jesus says this is this uh, has been allowed so that god may be glorified god is going to glorify himself by helping this man by healing this man and now again the same thing we see here uh, where god is going to glorify himself by doing something good for lazarus by doing good something good for those sisters you know so god glorifies himself by glorifying the son and he glorifies himself by doing good to people uh, so when we sing all the songs you know in uh, in church on sunday about you know uh, god's glory and then we, you know we we cry out to god and say lord glorify yourself uh, what we are doing is good because you know we are saying you deserve the glory o oh lord and you deserve to be glorified but the beautiful thing is that god he is going to be glorifying himself not just simply by exalting himself but by reaching out to these people who are singing and doing good for them because his heart is always towards them because he is a shepherd 
is not just a king, but he's also a shepherd. So he is always, you know, uh, reaching out and helping uh, those who are under him. So anyway, we see uh, over here that um, after two days, Jesus decides to go over there to that place. And um, we have this very nice statement from Thomas who says, OK, if Jesus is going to walk into danger, uh, you know, uh, by going over there, um, we'll also go ahead with him. And if he's going to be attacked, it's all right. You know, we will die with him. A very lovely thing that Thomas, you know, says he's showing his loyalty towards Jesus. Um, so finally, they come over here to this place. And, uh, you know, for lack of time, we are kind of moving on um, because there are many, many things that we can meditate upon, reflect upon in this passage. So moving into verse 20, um, and maybe even, yeah, okay, if, if someone could read out verses 20 to 22. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Yes, so... Um... Now, in those days, you know, when someone has passed away and that family is in mourning, uh, they would obviously just stay in the house mourning and then people would come to them. Uh, so which is what is happening over here. Uh, but then when Martha hears that um, uh, Jesus is, uh, is coming, she immediately gets up and goes out. Mary has not yet received the news. She still doesn't know that Jesus has arrived. Uh, but when Martha hears it, she immediately gets up and goes uh, to meet him. And uh, this is what she says, you know, in verse 21. Uh, she says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You know, because earlier he had sent the message saying, um, this will not end in death. The sickness will not end in death. That's the promise that uh, um, he had given them. And that's the assurance that they had held on to. But now there has been a delay and she doesn't know why the delay has taken place. And she says very regretfully, if you had been here, my brother would not have died because, you know, you would have fulfilled your word, Lord. What you promised us, you would have done. So over here, it's not a word of complaint. She's not complaining. She's just, you know, expressing regret. And she's saying, if you had got here, then he would not have died. And then she goes on to say in verse 22, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. So even though in this particular case, it did not work out, you know, for my brother, because you, you got delayed and you came late. Uh, but if you had, I know for a fact that my brother would have got well. I know it because, you know, she says, God will give you whatever you ask. So she is, uh, you know, speaking from that angle. She is not aware that he deliberately delayed. She does not know that. Um, I'm not sure whether her faith would have stood up to that kind of a test. But right now here, she's not aware of that. She's just assuming that circumstances led to the delay. And so she just expresses regret. And she confirms and says, I know if you had gotten here in time, I know you would have saved him. Because uh, even now, I believe that God will give you whatever you ask. And then Jesus replies to her and says, your brother will rise again. You know, because she's not thinking at all about his uh, coming back to life. Uh, because later on, she, we see that very clearly, right? Because when Jesus says, you know, move the stone, and she says, no, Lord, it's like too late. You know, you move the stone now, there'll be a real terrible stench because by now the decay would have started. Uh, so, um, so she in no way at all is she thinking about his immediate resurrection right here and now. Uh, so she, so, uh, but Jesus, even as she's talking in this manner in this 20, in verses 21 and 22, Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And uh, Martha still doesn't get it. And uh, so she says, yeah, I know he will rise again, you know, in the resurrection of the last day, because she has believed she and her sister and Lazarus have placed their faith in Jesus, that he is the Messiah. You know, she confirms that. So maybe we can actually read out these words, um, you know, and absorb them. So if someone could read out verses 23 to 27, please. He said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in him, though he die, yet shall he live. 
and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So she does believe that he is the Messiah. She does believe that he can resurrect. Uh, but she just assumes that this resurrection will be at the end time, you know, when all the uh, righteous are resurrected to live with him forever and ever. And uh, she um, is not thinking about his immediate coming back to life right now. Um, and then moving on from there, uh, if we uh, look at, yeah, maybe we can look at verses 33 to 38, because they're very relevant. Uh, 33 to 38. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept, so the Jews, so the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he op who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay, lay against it. Jesus said, take away yeah, the stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, th that should be... Uh... That should be all right. OK, so uh, here in this passage, which we just read now, uh, it talks about Jesus groaning uh, twice. All right, two times it says that he groaned. Um, and the word that is used over there, the Greek word, is something called embrimo, embrimaomai, or whatever. You know, you could look it up in Bible Hub, uh, where you'd have the Greek word mentioned over there. Uh, uh, the word over here almost expresses anger indignation and it sounds rather strange you know because um when jesus saw her weeping and the jews who came with her weeping he groaned you know he's indignant he's enraged uh, and that doesn't sound um uh, you know um, logical and we would wonder why what is there to get angry about? She's weeping because uh, you know her brother is dead. And the Jews who have come with her, they are weeping because they have loved this family and they're very hurt by what has happened. Why would Jesus, you know, the word over there, very clearly, I mean, I, I looked up in two, three different places. The word very, very clearly implies a kind of anger, a kind of indignation. So I think over here, and, and uh, it's also followed by another term, uh, so it says here, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. The word troubled over there, that's the Greek word teraso. And again, uh, that's a word which talks about very ag being something being very agitated. Um, the word teraso is in fact used in, in our uh, John chapter 5, verse 7, where it talks about how an angel is supposed to come and stir up the waters, you know, where you literally agitate the waters and get them moving. So here, this is Jesus' response when he sees her crying, uh, Mary crying, when he sees Mary crying and all the Jews who are with her crying, he, he is um, um, stirred up and indignant, angry in his spirit. And he is all stirred up on the inside. He's troubled on the inside. So I would very clearly say over here that uh, this is not anger against them. He is not saying, oh, they should not be weeping. Because you see, he himself weeps. He also cries. So he's not against their weeping. That is not what is making him angry. I think his anger is being directed towards sin and death and the works of the evil one, which have you know um, brought these things upon people. Uh, the shepherd is so indignant for his sheep that something so terrible, so painful is being you know unleashed upon humanity. And uh, so he is, is stirred up and is so angry and he's going to take action. You know, so uh, when we are in a tight spot, uh, when we are being suppressed and oppressed by you know um, uh, circumstances of life, or when people are acting against us, maybe, or even if when the devil is directly targeting us, we would really love the Lord to have this kind of an anger on our behalf. You know, this is exactly the way we would like him to get angry on our behalf, because here he's saying, I will not allow this to pass. 
you know i will take action i will do something about it so he's not angry at the people who are grieving rather he is angry at uh, sin and death and the devil who have uh, brought these things upon people uh, and then um, if we move on from there um, you know verse that, that, so that so that would be verse 34 where he groans in the spirit and he is troubled and then uh, verses 37 and 38 where uh, after jesus weeps along with the people uh, so someone says, huh, now he's weeping, but then you couldn't he have done something about it? Couldn't he have helped him from dying? Uh, you know, the man who can open the eyes of the blind, he could have kept this person from dying. So someone, you know, makes this kind of a very sarcastic remark. And now in verse 38, again, it, the same word, Embry Mao Mai is used. And uh, Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. So over here, the anger and the indignation is you know, uh, directed against the people who are wrongly judging the situation. They are passing a judgment against God the Father and against him very, very wrongly, not understanding the motives of God's heart and the heart of Jesus. Okay, So they are questioning him very wrongly. And so now this time, in the second groaning, his anger, his indignation is being directed against these people who have who are passing a wrong judgment because God has very clearly allowed the situation to glorify himself by helping Lazarus, not by harming Lazarus. Okay, that's very, very clear. God always glorifies himself by helping his people, not by harming them. Something so uh, true that we can just hold on to in our own times of trouble because sometimes when certain certain things happen to us and you know we wonder oh my how did this this terrible thing happen to me is god acting against me we can always be very very sure god glorifies himself by helping his people not by harming them Okay, we can always have this assurance. Um, so we should not be like this person, you know, standing over there and passed off a casual remark saying that, oh, you know, may God is not acting in this person's best interests. No, we can always have the assurance that the shepherd will always act uh, for his sheep in their best interests because he has come not to steal or kill or destroy. That's what the thief does. He has come to give uh, life and to give it abundantly so we can have this trust and faith in the uh, shepherd and uh, another thing that maybe we could you know just highlight over here uh, where it talks about how jesus wept um, this is something that is so uh, christian in the sense uh, the greeks at that time the gods that they believed in uh, they admired gods who would feel nothing you know, for them, that term stoic, stoicism, uh, that basically is the ability to feel nothing. So they admired gods who are stoic, who would feel nothing. And uh, they felt that that is the ideal kind of god, a god who feels nothing, can be moved by nothing, who's just there. You know, they considered that as strength. But then we see strength uh, a far greater strength over here where this god he cares so much about his people he's allowed his son to come down among them and be fully involved in their lives and participate in their suffering so um you know whom would we say is a is a, is a better ideal you know of god of godhood uh, someone who is stoic uncaring unfeeling just distant and sitting out there or someone who loves to such an extent so deeply uh, that he becomes fully involved with his uh, with his sheep you know so we see this very beautiful picture of godhood of what actual true godhood is like um, where because we see that the creator he weeps with his creation uh, with his people uh, when they are going through this time of stress um, he is not weeping because he has given up hope because he knows exactly what he's going to be doing. He has already very clearly told the sisters that right in the beginning itself, he said, this will not end in death. So he knows. So he's not weeping because the situation is hopeless. He is weeping because he is sharing in the pain of his people. He understands what they are feeling. And I think this is a very great comfort uh, to us, especially when we know we lose our family members. Uh, we can really know 
that even as we are standing over there and weeping and hurting, he understands how we feel because he too felt that, you know, so um, it says that he's a high priest who, who has, uh, you know, gone through everything that we have gone through. And so he fully understands uh, what we are experiencing. So when he was on this earth, he uh, experienced every aspect of pain and grief. So whatever situation you may be going through, whatever kind of pain that you are going through, it is something that he has experienced. He knows what it feels like. So, you know, that's the beauty of our God. We cannot just say to him, there you are, Lord, sitting on your throne and, you know, you're uh, allowing these troubles to come to me. What do you know how, how it feels? You know, what do you know? You're sitting up there in all of your comfort. And here I am in the middle of this. And, uh, you know, uh, people whom I trusted have turned against me. And now they are uh, persecuting me and I'm going through all of this. Uh, we can never say that to him because everything that we have gone through, he personally came down and experienced along with us. He participated in all of it with us. Uh, that's the amazing beauty of this shepherd. Um, so, um, yeah, moving to the actual, the, the crux of the passage, um, where Jesus, you know, uh, is now making the miracle happen. He begins with a prayer, and it's nice to see what he prays. Uh, if we could have someone read out verses 41 and 42, please. Verses 41 and 42. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was laying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Okay, so here Jesus says, he's making a prayer. Only it's not really a prayer because he says, uh, I thank you that you have heard me. Okay, he says. And then he says, I know that you always hear me, but I'm saying this for the benefit of the people who are standing here. Because you see a little earlier, some people had come to Jesus in the previous chapter and they said, now please plainly tell us whether you're the Messiah. So now... Jesus is providing the ultimate proof that he is indeed the Messiah sent by God. You know, because now he's going to be demonstrating that he has the Father's backing 100%. Okay, so um, he's deliberately speaking out these words uh, to, to point out the fact that when he approaches the Father regarding something, the Father gives it to him. 100%. There is, uh, he, has, he has the Father's complete backing. He is the one sent by the Father. He is the promised Messiah. So he uh, is going to be proving all of that. Because in the next verse, uh, it's very interesting. He doesn't say a prayer and say, Lord, now please raise up Lazarus. Rather, he speaks out. It says, when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. So he's not making a prayer to the Father and saying, Father, you please raise up Lazarus. Rather, Jesus is speaking out in his own authority and he's declaring and saying, Lazarus, come out, and Lazarus does. Uh, so here we see, you know, um, in, in Genesis, we see the creative act of God where the word speaks out and says, let there be light and there is light. And uh, using the word, uh, God brings forth all of creation and now over here you have this dead person being brought back to life through the word of god the spoken word of god uh, so uh, jesus is showing demonstrating that he has the power to use his word to make things happen to bring even a dead person who's beyond hope uh, who is in fact uh, decayed to an extent where he is uh, you know smelling uh, such a person just by a word, Jesus has the power to release life into that dead person and bring him forth. So Jesus is demonstrating his authority, his power, and he is also showing that he has the full father's backing in this. He's not. This is not something that he's doing on his own. He's doing it in line with the father because first he's had a conversation with the father 
for the benefit of the people to show them that this is not something that he's doing on his own, but he's doing it with the father's backing. So over here, you have the backing of the father clearly proved, and you also have the authority of Jesus very clearly proved. So those people who said in the earlier passage, plainly tell us whether you are the Messiah. Well, here's the proof. You know, here's the very clear proof that this is indeed the Messiah who has been promised. And um, so we see the response. Now Jesus has made it very, very plain. It can't get plainer than this. Uh, you know, a person who was literally had reached a point of putrefaction where his body was stinking. Now he's come out fully alive, fully well. And now this is the reaction to that. Uh, verses 45 and 46, if we, someone can read out. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary, had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Yes, so it's remarkable. A lot of people who have seen this, now they believe in him. He has made it very plain that he is the Messiah, and they believe him. But you still have some people who are now going you know, and instigating the Pharisees. Um, it's very, very... I don't know, shocking, astonishing that after seeing something like this, you know, instead of literally getting down on their knees and rejoicing and saying, oh my, finally, the one that we have been waiting has arrived. He is going to you know, release the works of the Father on this earth. And, and uh, now there is going to be hope. You know, instead of just, you know, breaking out in praise, these people, what is their immediate reaction? They want to quickly go and tell the Pharisees, this is what happened. Now, what are we going to do next? So it just so clearly exposes the motives of their heart. They have, they're have they not feeling any happiness for this family. You know, this, these two sisters who have got their brother back. Uh, there's no love at all in their heart for this family. They don't care at all what happens to this family. They are very, very... And, and in fact, it's strange. They're not even in awe of what Jesus has done. You know, they should be like shocked and they should be thinking, my goodness, how did this take place? Maybe we should really reconsider our, you know, our stand regarding Jesus. No, we don't see any of those responses. Here is a people who have genuinely closed their eyes. I mean, no one made them. They have chosen to close their eyes. And so they very, very quickly go and report to the Pharisees what has happened because now they really have a crisis on their hands. Uh, this is like an, uh, one of the you know most uh, amazing miracles that has been done. And now there's going to be a huge response from the crowd. And so now they are very, very concerned. And so they go into um, defense mode, and it's all very, very sad. This should not have been the response. They should have all just fallen on their knees and, you know, changed their ways. But the hardness of people's hearts, you know, we see a very, very different kind of response taking shape in the following verses. Uh, so if maybe one person can read out verses 47 and 48. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our plates and our nation. Okay, so um, they say uh, this person is now too powerful. You know, he's able to perform signs, he's able to make everyone believe in him. And if he uh, if everyone believes in him, then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. It doesn't really make sense, right? I mean, uh, why on earth would the Romans be interested on whom the people believe in? Um, why on earth would they come and take away the temple and the nation from them? Um, it's because uh, these, these uh, Pharisees and these religious leaders um, they cannot allow things to continue like this. They would be forced to take action and start off a series of riots directed against Jesus and his followers. And there would be a lot of unrest. And when the unrest happens, the Romans would quickly respond and react. And they would put down all of the unrest. And they would say, these people are unable to govern themselves on their own any longer. So let's just take away their, you know, whatever privileges they have had so far. And we will completely put 100% Roman rule. No more authority, no more sharing of power, no more of giving privileges. It will become, you know, 
100% uh, Roman uh, control over even the little places, and the Jews would be the Jewish leaders would be left nowhere. So over here, you know, where it's very ironic, the writing would be started by the leaders, and the leaders would start the writing to save their position, and they would be saving their position because uh, they would be trying to save their position because all the people would have gone to Jesus' side, and now how? They can't. Uh, they can't use logic. They can't use signs and wonders to draw people back to their side. They would have to resort to violence. They would stir up people. You know, sp spread false stories about Jesus, and then the people would get all worked up, and then they would go and have clashes with uh, Jesus' followers, who are basically you know peaceful people. They're not very. They're not violent at all. Uh, so it's the the entire tumult and rioting would be started by the Jewish leaders. They are the ones who would be doing it. And then because they would be doing that, then the Romans would come and intervene. And whatever privileges they had had up to that time, they would lose all of those privileges. So the Pharisees and the chief priests and the leaders are very, very concerned about all the rights that would take place, the rights which they themselves would be starting to save their next and, and to save their political power. And uh, if because if things were left peacefully uh, you know, as they are, people would just peacefully lovingly follow jesus and they would be praised and worship everywhere and uh, and um, there would be no violence at all but uh, the pharisees say they don't want that because if that happens then people will turn to jesus and they will have nobody left uh, under them and they would lose their position so um, so it's not jesus who would make the romans come and take away the temple and the nation rather it is something that the Pharisees would bring upon their heads because of the violent steps which they would take to hold on to their power. And so then Caiaphas, the high priest, comes up with this brilliant solution, which is completely selfish, you know. And uh, so um, which verses would that be? Um, so um, yeah, if we could once again just read verse 48 and then also 49 and 50. So 48, 49, 50, if we can have one person read out. Could someone be... Go ahead. If we let him go on like this, everyone will be live in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die, for the people, not, not that the whole nation should perish. Okay, so uh, he says, No, 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 we cannot allow this kind of a uh, situation to to you know uh, take form uh, before um, you know things move to a stage where we will have to take active steps and uh, then there would be a lot of clashes there would be a lot of uh, unrest um, we can't allow all of that simple solution kill off the man you know be done with him because once he's gone status quo will you know come back so that is the selfish solution which the high priest the top leader the main chief leader, he this the that's the you know uh, decision that he takes. He says, no, we cannot allow you know any unrest to continue form, forming and developing. We cannot allow more people to go over to uh, to Jesus' side. Before any of that happens, let's just kill him off because then the nation will be saved. Now the high priest is uh, has been you know is supposed to be. In a position, uh, he's supposed to be like the chief shepherd, where he is watching out for the uh, safety of the nation, where he is supposed to be shepherding the people and doing what is best for their uh, benefit. But here we see a high priest who's nothing like that. He is very much a hireling, he is not a true shepherd. And so, even though he talks about protecting the nation and you know saving it from destruction, what we actually see is that. This man is just trying to, you know, save his own position and hold on to his power. So he is a, he is a very um, clear example of a hireling. And then it says something very interesting in verses uh, 51 to 53. So if, if we could read out that, please, 51 to 53.
Now this, continue, continue, please. Go ahead, please. Now this, he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest, that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then, from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. So, even though the uh, chief priest, uh, technically the chief shepherd of the nation of Israel, even though he had closed his eyes and closed his ears and he had you know, hardened his heart, um, because of the position that he is holding, um, God uses his words to actually speak out a prophecy, to speak out what Jesus would accomplish. So of, of course, it's not saying over here that Caiaphas you know, understood uh, God's heart and spoke what God wanted. No, he was only speaking out of his selfishness. But without meaning to, he actually spoke out what God had planned. Uh, and uh, so sometimes it's a very scary thought, a very, very scary thought. We can be in positions of uh, Christian leadership. And uh, you know, just because God is using us uh, to accomplish his plans and purposes, we may be under the impression that you know everything is fine and we are fine. And at the same time, maybe you know we have gone very, very far away from God. So it's something that we need to check upon every single day. You know, when we spend time with him you know, during our private devotions, we need to re-examine ourselves and see whether we are really in line with the Father or not. Uh, because uh, he will continue to use our position, you know, the 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 position of leadership which he has placed us in, he will use his use that position to get his work done, to accomplish his purposes. But are we living in the right way? Are we as people, you know, in 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 line with his will? Uh, we need to check ourselves and make sure others will be like, you know, uh, like Caiaphas, you know, uh, fools who think that we are accomplishing what we are meant to accomplish, but actually we are very, very far away from his will. So um, it is something that we should never just simply trust our position and we should not simply be uh, falsely uh, secure just because God is using our position to get things done. But we must also check and see whether as people at a personal level, whether we are still in line with him and whether uh, we are still responsive and sensitive to him. That is something that we would very, very clearly need to uh, watch out for. And so it says over here that from that day on, uh, they began to plot against Jesus. And uh, it, it also says in verse 55 that the Passover feast was you know, nearing. And that's basically the time when almost all the religious leaders would go uh, to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. And so there's a lot of talk among people and they're wondering, will he come? Will Jesus turn up for that? Um, uh, because And if he turns up, what's going to happen? Uh, so all of that, um, you know, talk is generated even as the Passover feast is nearing. So these are the, just some of the main things that we could go through. Uh, we have about one minute. Anyone wants to raise any kind of you know question or just um, you know express your views regarding something. Uh, otherwise, you know we will actually close with a word of prayer. So anyone at all wants to say anything? Otherwise we can close. Yes, uh, we have uh, uh, Albuquerque brother raising his hand. Please go ahead. Yes, um, uh, in verse number four, I um, when when Jesus talks about you know, for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Uh, I just want to ask a question: uh, As human beings, uh, are we also? Uh, can we also? Get get glorified by God, and um, how how if so, how can it be? How is it manifested? Oh, could I have the verse because I'm unable to find it here? Oh, uh, uh, in chapter eleven, verse hmm. four, 11 where he four. talks about you know uh, the yes. sickness and not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So I was just wanting to know that. Uh, as human beings, can can we also get glorified uh, 
by God and how how is this manifested? So yes, um, um, now I wish I had scriptures to back me up uh, because uh, you know there are actual scripture references which where it talks about how uh, um, we too would be glorified, we would share in His glory. Uh, but my scriptural knowledge at the moment is <laughs> rather limited. But we do have scriptures where where it very clearly says that we would be sharing in uh, God's glory. So in that sense. Uh, we too would be glorified. We would get to share in His glory. And uh, how how exactly would we be glorified? Um, I would say it is mainly uh, through the reward that we would receive, where He would say, you know, I mean, uh, this person has faithfully served me and accomplished my purposes. So it's like a public declaration from God Himself, affirming that what we have done is right, and He's pleased with us. So in that sense, we would be glorified. And um, uh, to a lesser extent, maybe we could also say that um, the things that we do in line with God's will, which are a blessing to people, um, that kind of um, um, places, us, places us in a position where people look up to us. Uh, you know, uh, they see that we are people who are, who are representing God right. And to, to an extent, that kind of gives us some influence. Uh, but I think these are all things which I should probably, you know, know properly lay it out uh, with scripture references. So I will do that. All right, I will actually do that. I will put it in the stream page uh, where I will show verses which talk about us being exalted, you know, to an extent because we are in a particular position where we are representing God. And I'll, I'll also talk, mention those scriptures which talk about how uh, we will share in His glory. And I'll put it all up, you know, in a, in a very, you know, a small paragraph of three, four sentences or so with the scriptures. I will do that because right now what I'm saying is like vague and I'm not backing it up with scripture. I shall do that. Yeah. Um, uh, anything else at all? Otherwise, you know, we're, we're kind of a little over time. Uh, we would close. Anyone else? No? Okay, let's just pray and we will close. And I will uh, put up the, you know, references on the stream page uh, later in the afternoon. Lord, we just thank you so much for today's class. Uh, thank you, O oh Lord, for all the things that we could learn uh, today. We pray, O oh Lord, that uh, we would implement these things in our own lives. Thank you for that beautiful faith which uh, Martha expressed, where she said that even though the delay has happened, even now she says, I believe that whatever you ask the Father, uh, he will give it to you. Uh, such, such simple faith, O oh Lord. Uh, these uh, early Christians, they expressed in you. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we too would have that same kind of faith where we will be sheep who are willing to open our ears wide and hear from you, O oh Lord. Help us to never become people who will deliberately close our eyes to truths just because those truths make us uncomfortable. Help us, O oh Lord, to, uh, to truly be your sheep and truly hear your voice and genuinely follow you, O oh Lord, uh, in all that you ask us to do. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for participating in the class. And uh, we'll meet again next week. Amen. Pastor, God bless you. Thank you.